Guess who's late? Late again. Woot is late. Don't tell AMD. Well, as they say, better late than never. Today we're going to be doing the 7800X3D from AMD and I'm going to be doing my own little take because I found some interesting information that you might want to know and that is more on the CPU GPU combinations. So what can I tell you that you don't already know? We do know that Linus has hailed this as the greatest gaming CPU currently, well of all time but currently because obviously technology always develops. Nexus or Gamers Nexus, Steve has said the same thing. And this is all obviously post the whole sock issues as well as motherboards blowing up. But let me start with this. I told you so. I predicted that the 7800X3D would be a better CPU. And this is when I was reviewing the 7950X3D as well as the 7900X3D. This is simply because we are now dealing with one CCD instead of two. That means that we don't have any core parking issues. We're not having to rely on Microsoft Game Bar in order to prioritize the CPUs for gaming. So it's become a lot more simple, therefore a lot more effective. So because I was late as usual, I did something a little bit different. What I did was I took the 7800X3D and I did two comparative tests, one being with a 4090 and one being with a 7900XT. But for those who are looking at a 7800X3D for the first time, let's start off with looking at the specs. Okay, so if you have seen this before, just skip on through to the performance, but we're gonna go over the general specifications. So this platform is AM5, as is obviously all of the new Ryzen 7000 series. The CPU has eight cores and 16 threads. Base clock is 4.2 gigahertz, but it does boost up to five gigahertz. Now it actually can boost further than that, but there is an issue on the L3 cache overheating, but this is something that I'll explain in another video. Looking at L1 cache, we have 512 kilobytes. On L2 cache, we have eight megabytes. And on L3 cache, we have 96 megabytes. The default TDP is 120 watts, and this is on the TSMC 5 nanometer architecture. AMD does recommend liquid coolers for optimal performance because the max operating temperature or TJ max is 89 degrees. The 7800X3D is a PCIe 5 ready CPU and it has up to 24 lanes. It is also DDR5 supporting two memory channels. The CPU does have onboard or integrated graphics cards into the CPU with a graphics core count of 2 up to 2200 megahertz. The PCIe version for the CPU is PCIe 5 with 24 total usable lanes, the others going to Southbridge. So this is important when structuring your build. Lastly, max memory support up to 128 gigabytes on UDIM and the sweet spot at the moment is around about 6,000, even though AMD says 5,200, this was a while ago and we have seen good results at 6,400 as well. Now let's jump into the performance. Now note, before we go into the test, I have said this before, or I may have mentioned this before, that AMD actually restricted the frequencies and this is because of the high stress and high heat put on Vcache. So when comparing games, it's not generally a cut and dry situation because some games will optimize with a Vcache and some doesn't. So just bear that in mind as we go through the tests. So results may vary. The CPU used in both cases was obviously the 7800X3D. The motherboard was the X670E Tai Chi Carrera. The RAM was the Gil Polaris DDR5, 32 gigabytes at 5600 megahertz. This was in dual channel as a kit. The SSD was the Crucial P5 Plus 1 terabyte. The PSU was the Cooler Master Master Watt 1200 Watt. The GPU was the ASRock Radeon Reference Card, the 7900 XT in the first test and a 1490 in the second. We did use the PL360 Flux AIO and the case was an open frame case. Before we get on to the comparative game results, we need to go through the basic performance. Now on Cinebench R23, it hit 17,299 versus the benchmark from CPU Monkey that I always use. Our own results from the 7900X3D was 25,904, from the 7950X3D was 35,543. Then we have the 5800X3D sample at 15,125, showing a really good leap in performance on generation. And then just for reference, we have the 13900K and 13900KF. Looking at single core performance, we hit a score of 1767 versus a sample of 1811. Then our own results for the 7900X3D at 1983 and for the 7950X3D at 2023. 
Then for the previous generation 5800X3D, that was 1475. Then we have the 3900K and 3900KF for reference. For Blender Benchmark, we hit a score of 267 versus the cumulative scores of 275. So not too bad there. Our own scores for the 7900X3D was 408, the 7950X3D 557, and for the previous generation 5800X3D 139. Again, showing a massive generational improvement. Then we have the 3900K at 515 and the KF at 520. Geekbench, generally a mirror of Cinebench, where we have the 7800X3D in multi-core hitting a score of 14,302. This is versus the sample of 14,229. The 7950X3D hitting a 19243. The 5800X3D sample hitting a 11646. Then we have the 13900K hitting 20,305 for the K and KF variants. Again, showing a good generational performance growth. For single core, we hit 2,602 versus the sample of 2,731. Then for the 7900X3D, we had 2,817. Then for the 7950X3D, we had 3,015. For the previous generation 5800X3D, we had a 2,104. And then we have the 3900K and KF at 2,868. For 3D Mark, I will give you the 7900 XT with the 7800 X3D results. I do apologize on transfer, the data got corrupted for the 4090, but I will do that and I will show that in future videos. So do stay tuned for that, but I will put up the results that we got for Time Spy, Fire Strike, and the other tests in Speedway, Port Royal, and Solar Bay. For game testing, we tested four games in three iterations, being 1080p, 1440p, and 2160. We're going to start off with Assassin's Creed. On 1080p for the 7900 XT, we hit an average of 193, a 1% low of 140, and a 0.1% low of 94. That was overshadowed by the 4090, hitting an average of 218, so slightly above the 1% lows being a lot more stable at 161, and the 0.1% lows being a lot more stable at 127. For 1440p, the 7900 XT hit a average of 151 versus the average of the 4090 at 187. For the 1% lows, we had 108 versus 137, and for the 0.1% lows, we had 75 versus 103. The 4090 then kicked back on 2160, with the average for the 7900 XT coming in at 88, and the 4090 at 128. The 1% low is a lot better for the 4090 with the 7900 XT having 60 and the 4090 having 90. The 0.1% low is very close at 48 to 49. On Formula 1 2021, the 7900 XT in 1080p got an average of 262 compared to the 267 from the 4090, so very close there. Max actually beating the 4090 with 303 versus 299 and the minimum 193 verse 205, so a slight edge there for the 4090. On 1440p, we had a 201 verse 262, so the 4090 taking a lead there in 1440p gaming. For the max, 230 versus 297, so winning there again. And then the minimum 165 verse 195, again a win for the 4090. On 2160, for the 7900 XT, we had 116 being completely dwarfed by the 207 of the 4090. For the max, we had 131 versus 246, again a big one for the 4090, and on minimum, we had 95 versus 174, again the crown going to the 4090. Far Cry 6 is where things started to get really interesting. Now do note that Far Cry 6 is optimized more for AMD than it is for Nvidia, but the results speak for themselves. For 1080p on the 7900 XT, we hit an average of 196 versus the 4090 of 164. The max frames was 263 versus 231, and the minimum was 132 versus 116. So on all three fronts, the 7900 XT taking the cake. 1440p, a mirror of 1080p on 181 versus 168 on average. For max, we had 206 versus 229, so a win there for the 1490. And then for minimum, 136 versus 115, so more stability from the 7900 XT. 
On 2160, the 4090 came fighting back on 110 for the 7900 XT versus 138 for the 4090, but pretty close. The max was 120 for the 7900 XT and for the 4090 was 150. The minimums 100 versus 124. So Far Cry 6 really showing the ability of a 7900 XT and I would have really loved to see what this did with the XTX. Rainbow Six Siege for 1080p, the 7900 XT hit a average of 674, beating the 4090 score of 572. Max for the 7900 XT was 980 versus 768 of the 4090. The minimum was 403 for the 7900 XT versus 415 for the 4090. In 1440p, the 4090 started to take back its seat with the 7900 XT getting 511 and the 4090 getting 571. The max for the 7900 XT was 684 versus the 4090 of 475 and the minimum of 287 versus 432. For 2160, the 4090 kicked it into high gear leaving the 7900 XT in its dust. On average, it hit 503 for the 4090 versus the 7900 XT only hitting an average of 283. Max for the 4090 was 596 versus the 340 of the 7900 XT and for the minimums it was 226 versus 400 for the 4090 being the winner. So overall on the gaming really interesting results and the 7900 XT actually beating quite a few of the 4090 results and this is at less than half of the price. For the statistics, starting off with temperatures, Cinebench hit an average of 76 with a max of 85, so staying well below TJ Maxx. For ADA, CPU and FPU stress, the average was 65 and the max was 73. Blender hit an average of 72 and a max of 75. Geekbench, a average of 56 and a max of 76. 3D Mark CPU, a average of 65, a max of 80 and 3D Mark times by Extreme, a average of 62 and a max of 82. So really good thermals coming out of the 7800X3D on some really stressing tests. Something really interesting for me was the power draws. Now I did a comparison on the 7800X3D versus the 7900X3D. For Cinebench we had a max draw of 78 watts versus the 7900 having 116. We can look at all the other results, but obviously the 7800X3D is going to be lower because it has less cores and it's going to be pulling less wattage, but it just shows that there is a lot of thermal efficiency coming out of the 7800X3D. The frequency max, I also put a side by side, the 78 versus 7900X3D, and we can see on the 7800X3D that it never peaked above 5000. Well, it did just slightly in Geekbench. In Geekbench 6, 3D Mark CPU and 3D Mark Extreme. This showed that the 7900X3D had the ability to outclock, but not necessarily outperform in games. On to the conclusion this CPU is for gaming. People want to be able to make easy decisions when it comes to choosing a CPU, so I'm gonna make this really easy. Hands down, the 7800X3D is the easiest as well as the best choice that you can make for gaming. We can get really bogged down as consumers. We look at all the different variables, all the different situations, all the different hardware. This CPU is better for this, this CPU is better for this, that we end up confusing ourselves and making our choices harder when the choice should actually be really simple. Is this the best overall CPU for gaming? And it is. So the simple conclusion is if you are buying a CPU just to purely game, this is definitely the one that you should be considering. Now I'm kind of contradicting myself and saying that there is a caveat but the caveat is if you want to game and do something else at the same time, if you want to stream or record, then a 7950X3D or a 7900X3D may make more sense. If you do have any problems or you do have any concerns and you want some help, please feel free to reach out to me in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you as soon as I can. But guys, I really hope you enjoyed this review. Sorry again that it was late. Cheers guys and goodbye.